Thanks so much for that introduction. It's always great to come uh, back and see Dr. Harrington. We spent many years together in the trenches at uh, Duke taking care of patients, and now we're off into other pursuits. It's great to see uh, his success. I'm going to talk today about um, big data and the FDA, and let me just preface my remarks by saying I'm acutely aware that I'm representing 21,000 people who work at the FDA. There's no way I could possibly know all the details of what I'm talking about, but I couldn't be more excited about the opportunities that are before us. And I th the main thing I want to get across today is to show you some opportunities that you will have and to ask for your help because, and I think it's come across, I've been here since about noon, and to me it's come across in almost everything that people have said, that we no longer live in a segmented society where you have product developers and FDA and patients, they're all off in their corners wondering what the other person is doing. We have an ecosystem which is highly interactive, and I'm going to show you ways that the FDA is participating in an interactive ecosystem that creates opportunities for almost everyone. But this is a work that's very early uh, relative to where it will be in a few years, and I think you've heard that from many of the other speakers today. First of all, I, I start most of my talks with a sympathy session for you to understand why it is that um, it's pretty hard to know uh, everything that's happening in an agency like the FDA. These are pictures of everything that we regulate on the upper left-hand corner of cosmetics. Uh, I hadn't thought a lot about cosmetics um, in my prior career, but I'm learning. Food is enormous, and you may have seen last week we had the uh, release of the first change in the nutritional facts label in 20 years. The biggest thing for a person like me is calories are now really big on the label, so I'll, you'll be able, when you are in a hurry, to see how many calories are in the item that you're purchasing. Cigarettes in the middle. We also, just a couple of weeks ago, released our deeming regulations about uh, non-tobacco uh, products that have caused a lot of interest for good reason. Uh, E-cigarettes are the fastest growing small business in the United States, most likely, although it's hard to totally quantify that. And on the right-hand side, you see veterinary medicines. We regulate both medicines for pets and for animals uh, that uh, we keep around the house and also for animals that we eat. And so uh, this is a, you begin to think about what you heard with human health today. Imagine trying to regulate uh, medications, for example, for over 300 species, each of which is somewhat different. And uh, I've certainly learned that many people care at least as much about their pets as they do about their relatives. In fact, one of the biggest responses we've had to anything that's ever happened related to FDA regulation was the uh, pet jerky uh, fiasco that occurred when a number of animals developed renal failure due to uh, eating uh, pet jerky. Um, lower left-hand corner device is something that's really big in this area, and it's not just the traditional devices, devices that you need to think about. All the explosion of laboratory tests that you're talking about, and in addition to that, the computation being built into multiple types of devices. Of course, drugs in the middle, and then lower right-hand corner, you see uh, biologics. And uh, I don't, all I need to do is say uh, gene editing and CRISPR, and you have some idea of how different the future is going to be than it is now. So there's a lot to think about. And in addition to that, we got a complex mission. It's a little like academia, where teaching, research, uh, uh, patient care um, are not always in sync. Uh, our primary mission is safety, and it's just important to emphasize over and over that um, if Americans had to worry about what they ate, that it would get them sick or uh, cause major harm, this would uh, lead to a major change in lifestyle in a country like ours. And so um, keeping uh, the confidence of the public in safety has got to be our number one criterion for anything that we do. But right there in the mission statement is also advancing the public health by speeding innovations. And one of the fascinating things for me in this job has been uh, the view that I think historically has been mostly correct that um, regulation is, uh, impedes innovation. But uh, I'll show you some things today where I think regulation is actually stimulating innovation and I'm becoming a student of the idea that the right amount of regulation by creating a barrier to entry based on quality is something that actually stimulates real innovation, which is part of the definition includes the criterion of making something better, not just making it different. And I think that's a really important 
issue that we need to think about and learn about more. And right below that, and I was really delighted to hear the 23andMe presentation where the point was made that uh, measuring something and making good product is not enough. When you're distributing something to an entire country or to an entire world, you've got to inform people about how to use it. And putting that in, in language that people can understand um, is hard enough with doctors, but when you're talking about the entire public, um, it's an amazing uh, challenge that we deal with. And then uh, one that um, you know, I really wasn't prepared for, but I'm learning rapidly. It's, it's couched in the current mission statement. We're going to change it as counterterrorism, but it's really emerging threats. And Dr. Hudson, who's here, I know lives with this every day, but half of emerging threats is terrorism, and the other half is emerging infectious diseases. And um, if you think about it, um, it's kind of nice when you have a chronic disease or even an acute disease that you know is there, and you work away at the research and development, uh, you can do a lot of planning on what you want to do. But when something appears out of nowhere, you don't have a way to um, detect it, you don't have a way uh, to treat it, you don't have a vaccine for it, uh, and it's threatening people right away. You've got to have a standing capability uh, that can react very quickly. And this is a very significant part of the overall federal effort where the FDA has a major role. Just think about Zika virus today a bite from a single mosquito that 90% of the time is asymptomatic causes a finite rate of microcephaly, which is one of the most tragic outcomes that can happen um, to a baby. Um, and uh, we do, we, at, when we started, we had no way to screen the blood. It's sexually transmitted. Uh, we didn't have a laboratory test that could be used. We didn't have a vaccine. We didn't have a treatment. And we're rapidly, as quickly as we can, working with industry academia and hospitals to make that happen, all the time knowing that the major target for a vaccine, for example, would be pregnant women or women about to get pregnant. Uh, how do you do the trials and what's the level of toxicity you could tolerate in a vaccine for uh, pregnant women with so much uncertainty? So hopefully you feel sorry for me now, you can tolerate the rest <laughs> of what I have to say. So. I would just say that I'm astounded across the whole range of things that we do, the impact that big data is already having. But I think another thing that I got from today, the amount of data so far overwhelms the amount of knowledge that we have about what to do with it, that for people like you, uh, it's an amazing uh, future world. And I'll, I'll give you examples ranging from food um, all the way to population-based evidence generation. This is just sort of a graph. And I'm sad to say that Taha Cass Hood, who uh, you met last year, our chief uh, information uh, officer has decided to leave the FDA, but he put in four great years. Um, I know he's listening today and tweeting actively, so I welcome that. Uh, he's just done a tremendous job. And this is sort of a depiction that relates sort of a blobogram of uh, all the different ways that big data are affecting us by several uh, dimensions. So I was definitely not an expert in food safety, but it has been a tremendous education for me um, and wouldn't have thought about whole genome sequencing in, in, in this area. But uh, this is turning out to be tremendously uh, useful. Um, you're all aware of some recent outbreaks that have occurred. It's not uncommon to have uh, multiple different uh, stores in a chain, for example, uh, get affected by this. And uh, in addition to that, as we're doing more routine surveillance, the ability to detect what's actually in your food is quite um, interesting, sometimes startling and something that we're having to get used to. I had a fascinating uh, trip to CIFSAN, which is our about 1,000-person uh, unit, Center for Food Safety and Nutrition, uh, just last week. And one of the questions was, when we detect something in food that we didn't think was there before, it's probably been there all along, how do we decide what a safe level is? Um, because the methods of detection are so much more refined than they've been in the past. So um, obviously bacterial whole gen genome sequencing is big data. Uh, this is, these are just the specifications of a single uh, whole genome sequencing analysis of a bacterium. And um, you know, I'm, I'm proud to say that working with other federal agencies, we have publicly shared databases now that have this information in it with uh, over a thousand new isolates added each month and uh, roughly one genome per hour. Uh, you can imagine the amount of coordination this takes and you know the kinds of openness that uh, we have to gravitate to I think are exemplified 
you just think about the differences between states uh, in the United States, the fact that state agencies, federal government, the food industry, and often academia are working together on this. So here's a real example that's happened. Uh, listeria and smoked fish. So <clears throat> someone finds listeria. This is not a good thing in case uh, you didn't know that. It's not something you'd want to have in your fish. And the question is, was, where did the contamination occur? Was it before the fish uh, was smoked or was it after it got into the process of smoking? And using whole genome uh, sequencing, unfortunately in this case, we were actually able to determine that the fish was contaminated before it got to the smoking process. But then, amazingly enough, there were additional contaminants afterwards. So this is a situation where you'd probably want something done by the FDA before you got exposed to this fish. Um, but the ability to locate where bacteria come from by looking across situations and seeing that there's an, a, a relationship is a new thing that's a tremendous advantage now when it comes to food safety. Um, and uh, the mechanism for doing this, uh, genome tracker is something that uh, people at the FDA and also uh, NIH is very much involved in this in addition to state agencies. Um, there's, there's a lot of pride in the work that's gone into this. You'll see the open access genomic uh, reference database mentioned here. This is just a schematic um, of how it works, but you can begin to see, and just to mention one other thing, uh, just in the last few years, Congress passed a major set of uh, laws that you probably didn't have any reason to think about called the Food Safety Modernization Act. And this is essentially taking food safety from a system that was predominantly based on detecting outbreaks of problems and then investigating them in retrospect, pretty much like we used to do hospital safety, to a prospective system based on analytics uh, using surveillance um, and active analysis of big data to decide um, how and when uh, to intervene. And of course, this is complicated because making a decision, for example, to shut down a plant uh, is a major economic decision that can affect a lot of people. And where the decision thresholds are, when it's really pathogenic, when it's background noise, uh, major effort needs to go into this. But the great thing is by having publicly accessible data, multiple people working on it, um, the wisdom of the crowd of analysts um, is making the system better and better over time. And this is a theme that I see in every aspect of the FDA now. This is just a look at all the external labs that are involved uh, in this system, and it's quite an extensive, you know, it's sort of American in that it's not monolithic. Uh, Americans, I've certainly seen in this job, will not tolerate anything that's monolithic. It's just not in our culture to do that. But federation is something that Americans really like, where you maintain some independence, but you collaborate. And I'll get to that when we talk about some other areas of big data. And so then another aspect is the so-called IBM Mars Initiative uh, using uh, metagenomics to test the microbial environment for uh, food facilities. As you're all aware, we're very concerned about um, antimicrobial resistance, for example. There are laws now that will prohibit uh, farmers from putting humanly important antibiotics in the feed of animals, which was a common uh, procedure, uh, in fact, very common procedure until just uh, recently. So uh, being able to look at what's going on in, in, uh, in, in food facilities becomes a very important aspect. And, and obviously this is creating reams and reams uh, of data to analyze. This is an example where uh, big data is really um, paying off recently, uh, written up uh, in The Lancet. Uh, complete typing of strains associated with ingredients and finished product uh, gives you more than traceability uh, is the point here. You know uh, the profiles of antimicrobial resistance as you begin to put uh, this information together. And I certainly don't pretend to be an expert here. I'm relating uh, the work that's going on. And there are many examples that I can't talk about, but the main uh, uh, thing I want to show here is that by having large data sets and continuous surveillance continuous analysis, you begin to see things that allow you to preempt the kinds of problems that used to cause people to die or have uh, major illnesses from foodborne um, issues. And then you begin to really let your imagination run wild and you begin to say, 
what is the right uh, microbiome environment for a farm, for a place that sells food, and for the human that's ingesting that food. Um, all of you who are into big data, uh, quantitative aspects, you should go crazy with this and make sense of it. I, I certainly don't completely understand it, but it's really exciting. Another use is in dietary supplements. Um, don't ask me to explain why Americans love dietary supplements. Um, it's not in my job description to say that, but dietary supplements are commonly ingested by Americans, and we are able to use um, uh, next generation technologies to see what's actually in the dietary supplements that people are uh, buying, and this has been a matter of some news uh, in recent months. And obviously, we're limited by uh, size of data and cost, but as for the same reason that in human health environments, the cost is going down, the computational storage data is going up. The ability um, to do this on a large scale is growing quickly. And then we have probiotics. Uh, when people uh, uh, ingest things um, that um, are, are thought to have uh, these characteristics, we can now um, characterize them in ways that were just simply impossible until very uh, recently. So these are multiple uses of big data in the food um, environment. And um, it, it's really been fun for me to learn about it, but I also feel much more confident now when I go to the local grocery store that maybe things are okay. In the future, they're gonna be even more okay because this is not just FDA people inside the FDA um, looking at data you know, in a dark environment. This is a collaboration of farmers, state agencies, stores, FDA, NIH, and other agencies to create a big data environment that um, many people can look at and make sense of. You've heard from Claudia Williams already today, you're gonna to hear from Kathy Hudson tomorrow, but I just wanna make the point that the FDA is very involved in the PMI initiative. Um, it's really exciting. I won't dwell on it because um, you're hearing about it, so I have to make a couple of points that are relevant to the FDA. It's amazing to have a president who's personally interested and very knowledgeable about these issues, and I can assure you he is, I can also assure you that he's so interested in this that um, he can make personal phone calls asking you why you haven't gotten your homework done. And uh, I, it, this brings a quick response, I can tell you, in federal <laughs> agencies. But um, much like the things that you've heard today, I th the, one of the points I wanna make, both from the FDA perspective and I think from the whole PMI perspective, this is not just about genetics and genomics. It's patient partnerships. It's electronic health records, it's wearable technologies, um, it is genomics, uh, and of course data science is at uh, the base of this. So it's really the integration of all these that makes a difference. Now, um, I don't need to tell you probably that uh, for precision medicine to work, you gotta know what's wrong first before you prescribe the targeted treatment. And so diagnostic tests become absolutely critical. And these tests need to take place um, in a learning health system environment because at the rate the ability to measure things is increasing, there's no way that the old-fashioned methods are either gonna allow um, you as researchers to know what the test means or us as regulators to know whether people should be exposed uh, to the test. And so we've been working very hard on novel ways of regulating, which we think are actually stimulating innovation uh, in very interesting uh, ways. So this has led to the Precision uh, FDA um, initiative with a vision of new regulatory policies to promote research and actually accelerate uh, translation of technologies. In the near term, this means developing standards and shared resources together with the community. In the long term, it means implementing standards-based regulation. I'll just say a few words um, about that. In the old days, we did one test at the time, and that's still the case pretty much today, you have to prove that you're measuring what you want to measure. I thought the 23andMe um, presentation you know, made that point nicely. And you have to show it has clinical validity, that the test actually tells you something worthwhile. And you have to be able to describe what the test means in ways that people who use the test can actually use it. Um, when you go to three billion base pairs all at one time, you can't do that one at a time. And so, the idea here is to develop, um, and we're doing this together with the NIH, uh, a data commons where large amounts of clinical data can be put together in a more public way that allows test developers to develop their tests and demonstrate the operating characteristics uh, of the test in a way that the FDA can see it 
but so can competitors and other uh, people who are interested. Um, and so you begin to get the idea, just like in the food and farm environment, that it's the ecosystem as it gets a higher degree of transparency and a higher degree of reliability and predictability that becomes uh, something that's uh, much better for the public. So uh, we're hard at work at this. Uh, we're well along with multiple meetings about standards and have some guidances under development about this. And we're developing these open source tools and data commons uh, that I mentioned. And so the idea is to uh, take populations, take the data from populations, um, using analytics, um, make it uh, accessible to um, as many people as possible where human phenotypes are also available so that we not only has, have analytical validity but also clinical validity and hopefully, voila, we have a healthy population. Obviously not quite that simple, a lot of work to do, but I hope you're beginning to get the idea of how we're looking at test development. Now, Precision FDA has been a pretty amazing part of this in my view. It's really Taha's brainchild, but a whole group of people have also at FDA have been uh, working on this. And the idea is to develop a community platform where uh, next generation sequencing, assay validation, uh, can be done and people can explore regulatory science um, in an open space. Uh, this has been wildly successful. Uh, we got over 1,500 users from over 600 organizations around the world uh, already using it and we're beginning to have competitions where uh, people compete um, in this space to see who can do the best job and learn from each other. And so this is uh, the genesis of what Dr. Harrington mentioned, the precision FDA consistency challenge, and at the end of my uh, lecture, I'll tell you who the winners um, are here, um, where you have a reference um, sequence, and the, uh, and the question is, uh, whose pipeline can most accurately and consistently um, get the answer right to the test? And we think this is a paradigm for a lot of future um, testing that can write the system through uh, community behavior. And so, um, uh, this is really uh, the goal of Precision FDA, advancing precision medicine through collaborative uh, informatics. Then the last part here is uh, I, something that you probably know I've been working on a long time, and I'm really excited about where we are right now. Um, Evidence-based practice is not a new thing. Uh, the problem is we haven't had so much actionable evidence to practice upon. And the question is, how do we develop a system that generates evidence at a radically faster pace that can be used by all participants, patients, doctors, health systems, payers, uh, in a common way. A simple way that I think about this is to the extent we have great evidence, then clinicians can use their expertise to decide what to do with the evidence in instead of trying to figure out how to make the best guess in the absence of good evidence, which is the case for a lot of what we do. And then we can really begin to integrate in a rational way the preferences and values which do differ in the population I know you all have talked about. And uh, with the sort of social media experiences that you were talking about before, there's a real opportunity to integrate preferences for chronic diseases in a way uh, that we would have never thought about before. So the vision that we've been working on together with um, a number of partners is a national medical evidence generation system that integrates clinical care and research. If you're at the IOM, now the National Academy of Medicine, you call this a learning health system. It's not a new thing, but I just want to give you an idea of where we think uh, we're getting near a tipping point on this. From the FDA perspective, um, this is all about generating evidence for the evaluation of medical products. There's an entire systematic way to do this. It's not uh, anything new, but we believe that that whole segment from clinical trials through clinical practice guidelines has been suffering from um, technology which is not up to date with where we should be today. And we want to change that and we think we're making progress. Again, why do we, I think we need to make the change. Dr. Harrington and I are cardiologists. We're quite proud of our belief that we have the most evidence-based practice in medicine. There has been a competi uh, competition about this. We found that 85% of our major clinical practice guidelines are not based on high quality evidence. No other field has been able to beat that. Oncology is at 13 percent. My little brother's an orthopedic surgeon. They're not even looking. It's just not, 
not worth the trouble. So um, how do we change, and you know, you're aware that uh, highly supported CDC guidelines on opioid, a major national epidemic, which we completely support. It's the best that we can possibly do today, and practitioners need to pay attention to it. None of the 13 major recommendations have high quality evidence supporting them. This is something that we need to fix. And the solution is to take advantage of what's happened all over America, which is that we're all going in, getting our health care. Our data are being recorded electronically, um, and we're uh, moving along with it. And so together with multiple partners, um, as several people have mentioned this afternoon, we now have health claims data on 190 million Americans, the Sentinel system. But the other big player in here is obviously the medical products industry, which is doing uh, clinical trials all over the world. And we're working with them in a parallel way to try to develop not only a system that incorporates uh, claims data, but also clinical data from clinical trials into accessible formats. And the idea would be that we have a national system federated, not owned by the federal government, but owned by the people who generate the data that can uh, give us the evidence we need at a much faster rate. So uh, what makes me believe that we can do this now? And it's been the change that's occurred from the old system of clinical trials where we had a coordinating center and a bunch of sites, to global trials where we had more than one coordinating center, to now what we have, which are numerous healthcare systems, which are routinely collecting data, put it, putting it in better and better curated data warehouses that are massive, um, and unfortunately right now mostly hoarding it. And what I hope you'll do at Stanford and other areas is to um, talk to your healthcare system administrators to say these data are really valuable, not just to people at Stanford, but to the whole world. And what we need to do is, is to connect uh, these nodes into a system that works. And so uh, if we think about this then, um, we can have multiple healthcare systems that are sharing data using common uh, nomenclature um, in a way that produces data at a much, uh, information at a much faster rate. Now Kaiser, um, pretty big out in this part of the country, is a national system that with the Sentinel effort, when they realized it would be good to aggregate all of their data, went to work on this, um, has developed a very refined system where uh, all the regional Kaisers uh, submit their data, it's analyzed, but of course the goal is not to just have it going in, but to have it come back out in the form of analytics and decision support. Well, we think these same data could be used uh, in the example of drug safety in the Sentinel network. In fact, they are being used uh, in a massive way for drug safety. This system is getting better and better. But what if we had a device issue? If you think about it, the data that you need for devices is almost exactly the same as what you need for drugs. Once you know who the patient is, uh, what device was put in, the health outcomes are really uh, what matters. And if you had uh, a system that used the same data for a different purpose, it could be tremendously powerful. And then uh, what if we had comparative effectiveness that we needed to do? Let's say CMS needs to decide what to pay for. We have a system uh, that could use um, the data for the same purpose. And so uh, using these kinds of open systems, our experience has been uh, that as they get used over and over, it gets better and better. This is uh, a look at Open FDA, which was our initial attempt to open up FDA data. As I'm sure people have talked about today, we have a lot of issues to deal with here because embedded in our data, as I think Russ elegantly pointed out, are trade secrets and things that relate to patents and all sorts of issues that we have to sort out. But our experience is when we open up FDA data, people are interested and a lot of people uh, use it as shown here in Taha's slide of what's happened with open FDA. A lot of publications occur, but more importantly, I think, uh, it can be used for a lot, of, uh, a lot of purposes other than academic publications as people develop new technologies that might work. So finally, um, you know, as we begin to think about integrated systems across this whole spectrum, this is just an example showing that um, if we go from the old system uh, where we're sort of retrospectively trying to figure out what's going on to a system where we begin to measure things in multiple places and put it together using integrated uh, data systems and informatics, uh, we can go to a proactive system that really um, preempts problems instead of uh, waiting for them uh, to occur. And this can occur without people losing autonomy. It's not 
a monolithic federal system. Uh, it's, a, it's a federated system. So I appreciate your attention. This is sort of a glimpse at the things we're working on. You probably get an idea this is a bit overwhelming. Um, you guys are moving at a faster rate than old-fashioned regulation can deal with it. Uh, but we need to work together because I can assure you that um, it's very easy in my perch to see that if we compromise safety in the interest of innovation, um, it will set all of you back in what you're trying to do. And so we've got to think very carefully about where regulation can not only keep people safe, but also uh, accelerate innovation, which I hope I've shown you today. So thanks for hanging in there at the end of the afternoon. I look forward to questions and comments you might have. Oh. Let's see. One little thing before Dr. Harrington comes out. I forgot we actually do have awards. This is the part I'm going to read because um, th this, is, this is actually really exciting. I think this is the first of many competitions we're going to have. So to engage users and encourage data sh sharing and ideas, Precision FDA has instituted two competitions. They're designed to motivate community members to demonstrate the effectiveness of their tools, test the capabilities of Precision FDA platform, and engage the community, and to serve as a comprehensive source of information about reference data sequences and existing si software pipelines uh, to analyze sequence and results. The first challenge, the consistency challenge, was launched to help introduce users to Precision FDA as a viable platform, show the platform what the platform is capable of doing, and engage the genomics community. Participants were giving, given two data sets of whole genome sequences from a known human sample sequenced at two different sites and generously donated to Precision FDA by the Garvan Institute of Medical Research and Human Longevity Incorporated. Challenge participants were instructed on the DNA sequence and expected to use uh, their informatics pipelines of their choice to see if they could produce the same sequence and identify the same genetic variants and then do it again to check for consistency between results and the provided data sets. This is a risky thing to do if you're not sure of yourself, so I'm really uh, excited that people applied. We'd like to acknowledge and thank all of those who participated for their engagement and contributions. We received 21 excellent entries from 17 submitters, and this afternoon I'm pleased to announce the three top performers in the challenge. The overall top performer in the Precision FDA Consistency Challenge is the Cention team for their overall high performance in both reproducibility and accuracy. Is the representative from Cention here? Yep, come on up and get your award. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Now, for the other 20, uh, people did really well, but it's, uh, this, is, this is something to aspire to. Now, imagine that you're a citizen out there and you're interested in whether uh, people doing your tests are any good. It, wouldn't this be an interesting way to demonstrate publicly that your test has great operating characteristics? Um, the top uh, per performer receiving the highest reproducibility is also Cention, which is interesting. And then the top performer for achieving the highest accuracy is Deepak Grover from Sanofi Genzyme. Deepak Grover couldn't be here today so we'll give him his award at a later date. Again, I want to thank everybody who participated and also tell you about the second challenge, the Truth Challenge. That's an interesting name. Commence on April 26th and it closes tomorrow night, so there's still time to get your application in. <laughs> it's designed as a collaboration with the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, which as you know, um, is uh, centered here at Stanford, uh, the, this component, and the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. Participants are expected to identify genetic variants in one known and one unknown sample data set. The goal is to see how close they come to the truth when sequencing uh, data from a human sample with variant results unknown to them, which we will reveal at the end of the challenge. The twist of this challenge is that the Genome in a Bottle Consortium will release for the first time new high-confidence calling variants. Uh, we refer to them in this challenge as truth data set for the human sample at the end of the contest. And I look forward uh, to uh, seeing the entries together with the FDA team. So thanks again. I'm sorry I went a little bit, little bit over, but it's pretty exciting 
to have this sort of public contest with data, which is just going to grow and get better and better. So, Dr. Harrington. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob, and uh, congratulations to, uh, to the winner. We have uh, open mic, so your opportunity to put your taxpayer dollars to work and ask Dr. Califf questions certainly is the field open. Rob, l l let me kick it off, is that I've heard you in other sessions talk about the opportunities, particularly for young scientists and young clinicians, to come work for the FDA. And the world you describe of all of the amount of data available across the various domains that you guys work in, it's extraordinary. You want to talk a little bit about that? You bet. We got jobs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we uh, I mean, the, the FDA is one of the few federal agencies that's really grown substantially. Um, in 2007, I was on a subcommittee of the Science Board, and we noted that the FDA had overwhelming work then. Congress has responded by increasing our funding, but we also have user fees and the relevant industries, it turns out, are very interested in having smart people at the FDA to regulate their products. So uh, if you look at the variety of data that I showed you today and the opportunity to impact human health, I think there's a great opportunity. And I would, you know, I think a long career at the FDA is great, but if you just need a few years, um, I would submit that a few years at the FDA will give you credentials and knowledge that you can't get anywhere else. It would serve you well um, as you go out and do other things. So uh, we're open. Uh, we actually have a large number of jobs available. Um, they're great jobs. I'll also mention that we're, sound like Donald Trump now, jobs. <laughs> um, Just don't say make the US FDA great again. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we, uh, we, we're also developing more programs that will have exchange of fellows. Russ Altman, they're CIRCES, which are Centers of Excellence in regulatory science that Russ described. And Stanford, fellows in informatics are doing a lot of work with Precision FDA. It's been a great help to us. Question yep. in the middle there? Mm, yeah. mm. Uh, hi, my name is Sohib. So I'm a student here, actually. And I guess I wanted to uh, get to see if we could get your opinions on the 21st Century Cure Act. And, you know, just when you guys are thinking about that right now and the ramifications of that for you and the processes you have in place, what do you guys think of that? And, you know, how are you even looking at adjusting the processes you have in place for, you know, future regulatory approvals? Well, so, uh, first of all, most of what I showed today, I think, is showing you the future of regulatory ap approvals, which is totally based on having high quality data. It's just that our um, understanding of the depth of data that can be brought to bear is just radically different than it was only a few years ago. So um, as the data environment changes, the regulatory environment will also change. Let me also mention a part I didn't mention that's been a real revelation to me. We have drugs that have, are now generic, they've been on the market for over 40 years and we're still finding out new things um, about them. So. When people, when they think about regulation, they tend to think about what gets on the market. We have responsibility for products for as long as they're used together with the regulated um, industry. So it's a remarkable, um, never ending uh, growth of uh, needs uh, that we have. As far as the legislation goes, um, I mean, as, as you probably know, the House uh, passed a bill, the Senate's in, um, is working on a bill right now. And I can't talk about legislation that's underway. Um, but, you know, we've officially said the House version uh, we thought was pretty good. Um, we, all legislation has good and bad parts, and so we're working, um, we're able, we're allowed to give technical assistance to the Senate as it's working on, uh, on its bill. Dr. Snyder? So, um, Maybe keeping with the theme of this conference and uh, enabling health, I would like to hear you elaborate a little bit more on some of your thoughts. It's, it's hard to prove something keeps you healthy, especially when the outcomes can be fairly varied, uh, such as whether it's DNA tests or other sorts of things, or, without taking very, very long times or certain things. So what are some of your thoughts as to how to make this uh, go more efficiently, or, or what are some of the hurdles or obstacles? I guess I'm welcoming more of your thoughts there <laughs> on how to keep things healthy. Mike, you're always so impatient. I am very impatient. Well, um, you know, I'm, 
want to prevent aging. That, that was the second question I was going to have. <laughs> what do you think about some of these anti-aging uh, uh, therapies that are coming out too? Because they actually fall under the same theme. Well, so uh, let me just say that uh, the hurdles are many. And um, I, I, uh, I, I mean, what could be more exciting than to think about some of these things and try to figure out uh, solutions. But uh, when you're talking about maintaining health, you're talking about maybe interventions where you won't know the effects for 20 or 30 years. Um, just taking a disease like Alzheimer's as an example, preventing Alzheimer's is something where you wouldn't see anything for a very long time, and yet you have all the risks which would become uh, obvious during that time. So yes, it's difficult. Uh, we know we're going to have to make educated guesses. The criteria are not uh, are not yet defined for many of these things. It's a, it's a topic of great discussion. Um, and when I met with the UCSF Stanford Searcy group, um, you know, which is a funded uh, public-private partnership that we have, um, I really would encourage uh, members of the academic community to not engage in sort of one-off, I want this thing to get through, but to come up with principles that would allow um, a principle-based uh, regulation of these um, issues. And, um, you know, I'll just mention a couple that are in play just to give you an idea so it doesn't sound totally opaque. Um, we know that if you have a, a lethal disease with no treatment, that people are willing and eager to take greater risks than if you have a disease that already has multiple effective treatments that um, work quite well. And so that you would have different regulation. So we have the breakthrough and accelerated and orphan uh, pathways for that at the FDA. So we'll have to think about things for that, like that for maintaining health or preventing um, chronic diseases, but um, we're not there. So I, I would urge people like you to uh, come up with principles that might guide us. You know, again, I'll say, as I've told many people, I've, I've lived with entrepreneurs my whole career. I'm a cardiologist. We tend to be that way. And in general, entrepreneurs have a hard time seeing the downsides of uh, the exciting advances that they think they can get. But remember that over 90% of what people try based on great ideas turns out to either be not good or dangerous. So um, we've got to, we, we can't dismiss the safety side of this. Way in the back. Hi, I'm Alex Lash, the National Biotech Editor at Xconomy. Um, there's been a rather unprecedented number of drug approvals the last few years, kind of near peak levels or record levels. So given what you've outlined with the Sentinel program and the changing landscape of um, evidence-based data, is it, could we assume that this level of drug approvals will continue, um, that, that perhaps smaller and smaller samples, knowing that Behind that approval, there'll be a, a larger and larger body of evidence to follow the outcomes of those patients or, or the outcomes of those, those drugs that have been approved. Yeah, I appreciate your question. Let me try to make two points here. First of all, I just want to embed in everyone's um, thinking, whether you believe me or not, I just want you to remember this. Um, it's not just Sentinel. It's really, think about three dimensions there. Claims data, which we now have on a national basis. There's EMR data, 300 million Americans have EMRs. They're almost all in integrated health systems. And uh, as I'm sure Claudia told you, the law says those health records belong to the patients, not to the doctors, not to the health system. Um, uh, and then the third dimension are a number of quality registries that are developing uh, based around either diseases like cystic fibrosis, where if you want to take care of patients with cystic fibrosis, you essentially have to agree to put your data into a quality system, which is owned by the patient um, cystic fibrosis foundation. You put those three together, you've got a pretty comprehensive picture of um, health outcomes and other information. So that's the opportunity. It's a different playing field than the playing field that existed in the past. Your second point about the record approvals, I love the way Johnny Woodcock says this, and she's written several editorials about this. We, at the FDA, we're referees. We um, evaluate drugs. We're not there to approve drugs. We're there to evaluate drugs and devices. And if the benefits outweigh the risks and with evidence that um, would meet the standards of competent experts, then uh, that's what the law says, then uh, we give approval. So 
number of approvals is going to totally depend on the state of the science and the degree to which um, research and development people um, do good research and development. And I'd have to say, and I'm sure Peter would agree with us having run R&D at Merck, um, have some luck. <laughs> Uh, Bob knows this, about 20 years ago, I actually called a bunch of people and I was trying to find people who had successfully developed more than one drug. That's a very small group of people. Most people who have had a success, they never do it again. Um, and most people that had brilliant ideas never succeed. So, um, but I think we're in a time of science with targeted therapies, a better understanding of biology, uh, big data on the biological front, and also um, changes in chemistry, and I, I want to call out 3D printing as another example where technology will make it uh, easier and faster, for example, to make supplies for clinical trials, which is a non-trivial issue. I, I would predict we're just going to see a flood of effective treatments, but, uh, and then we'll have to figure out what to do with them. So if I had to give a short answer to your question, it would be yes. I, don't, I think this is the beginning of a revolution in biotechnology, and not just for drugs, but also for devices and for combinations. There's an estimate that up to 30% of products in development now are combinations of drugs and devices. And again, to ask for sympathy, they exist under different laws, but they're in the same product, which if you want to have a regulatory nightmare. Rob, since you're, you're, you're talking a lot about, you know, the science is moving fast, and, uh, and therefore that may translate itself into better uh, therapeutics. What about, what's your current thinking on the efficiency of clinical trials, which has been sort of the log jam of, uh, of the development process? What, what's the current work that you're doing to make this more efficient? Yeah, I know I had to rush through uh, a bunch of slides, but let's go back to the last third of my talk. <clears throat> As the, uh, this fabric of um, electronic health records, claims data, registries gets better and better, and that wheel's gonna to continue to turn because uh, if, if you uh, a cardiologist, you do procedures, your data's gonna be looked at in the ACC AHA database. If you're a Stanford Health System, you gotta produce quality reports. You use your data warehouse for your business purposes and to do population health, that's gonna get better. And as long as America exists, when people do a procedure or, it, or see a patient in clinic, they're gonna submit their bills. People want to get paid, so that data is going to get better and better. The paradigm for clinical trials used to be what we call the parallel universe. You have you do it like an experiment off to the side, away from clinical care. And for early phase clinical trials, that's still the case. But for the later phase, where the costs have escalated, we've got to switch to a system where you take advantage of existing data, but you use randomization still as a key tool. The idea that you can magically, analytically work your way into a causal inference for most treatments, um, I think, is a myth. And so, you know, we're going to publish a number of things saying we think the highest form of, of evidence for medical products, and, and, and amazingly, I told, uh, Andy Slavitt, the CMS administrator, I just learned is 15 miles away at a meeting, so I don't know why Washington is in <laughs> Silicon Valley right now. But Slavitt would tell you the same thing. We need the same data. We need to know that products work and that we can write labels that inform people how to use them for the intended population. CMS needs the data to figure out what ought to be reimbursed and how much. So we need to use pre-existing data. That'll drop the cost of trials by a log order or more. And we'll have much better data and people will be able to focus on precision medicine instead of making wild guesses about what to use. Was there a question over here? Yes. Hello, Dr. Califf. My name is Alex Toy. I'm a healthcare law attorney at Genentech. Um, th thanks for being here, and it's great to see the FDA is so supportive of uh, precision medicine and big data. So given that there's so much interest in from industry, payers, healthcare systems, uh, academia, in generating and using big data, um, and in light of you know, the recent First Amendment cases protecting free speech, um, truthful non-misleading language, uh, as well as uh, CMS's increasing emphasis on quality and not just quantity of care, uh, what are your thoughts on the potential for companies to be able to discuss big data and real-world evidence? And then as a follow-on to that, what are your thoughts on um, the validity of 
retrospective claims data analyses versus prospective big data studies. Thank you. All right, so how many hours do we have? You got 22 seconds. No, just right. For those of you who don't know, that was a loaded question. <laughs> um, so I'm going to, uh, here, here's, here's my answer. First of all, um, I think there's been a huge error made in uh, the non, -ex I'll call it the non-technically expert world, pitting randomiz randomized trials on one, act on one side and big data on the other. At one point I was just trying to make in my previous answer, these are not on the same axis. They're two different dimensions. One dimension is what's the source of your data? It can be real world. It can be rarefied in a, in a research clinic set off from clinical practice. And so the question there is what, what quality does your data need to be to answer the question at hand? The second axis is what's your uh, method? What's your research method? Or I prefer to call it learning method because um, in, a, in a learning healthcare system, it ought to be that every patient provides information that uh, accrues knowledge. Um, but different methods are appropriate for different uh, purposes. And so that's why I say, um, if you say what's the, if you had a druidism X, Y axis, the desirable um, quadrant is randomization using real world data, because then you're informing people about how treatment works, or the way it's gonna be used in practice. And we're not there yet, but we're getting closer and closer. Um, companies can talk about uh, data that's in the label. And um, another construct that I very firmly believe in is if people want to rationally use medical products, the two basic tools that ought to exist are the FDA label, which is highly vetted and has standards, and clinical practice guidelines, which can fill in all the nuances and things in between. And so I would urge companies when they are thinking about their R&D programs to really orient them to what can get in the label and what will inform clinical practice guidelines, then you're totally safe in terms of what you talk about. We are gonna make some moves at FDA to make it easier to get things into the label. Not easier in terms of the standard, but um, there's some things about um, bureaucracy that get in the way that might cause people, even if they have good data, to not wanna go through the trouble post-market to put it in the label. That, that, so I'm not referring to dropping standards. I, Sure, you know what I'm talking about there. So um, at the very bottom of our list in terms of quality of evidence is you got a bunch of messy data. You don't know exactly where it came from. It wasn't collected with any purpose in mind. Doesn't have data standards. And you're going to mine the data and try to draw a causal inference. We have no confidence in that as a method um, of informing people about causation. It's a great way to monitor adverse events, is the point has been made today or to formulate hypotheses about what should be done. And I just want to remind everybody, uh, because it, it, I, I appreciate the question, but I've been studying the history of the FDA, and you're all aware, I think, that prior to 1962, you didn't have to show that a drug was effective. And uh, when thalidomide occurred, it was not just a matter of uh, the safety issue. What had happened was 1,200 physicians in America were distributed thalidomide because it was believed that if doctors used a drug, they could figure out if it was effective. That was the standard, an individual doctor treating his or her patients. And you know the story of thalidomide. Um, and some very wise people passed a law that said, uh, you've got to meet a standard uh, to get on the market. But that uh, market has a lot to do with the standard for promoting uh, what you are making uh, to a public that may be unsuspecting. So there are a lot of things that will work out in the courts, and um, I, you know I can't give great insight into how that will play out. But our mission uh, is to get good information in a place where the public has access to it. Just one other quick thing to mention. If you think about FDA labels and clinical practice guidelines, uh, there is an industry now working on taking that derivative data and creating useful ways of presenting that, but I would say it's nowhere near where it needs to be. I would, I would put that up as a tremendous place for uh, brilliant people with informatics to do good things now because a combination of those two things should be the fabric that clinicians and patients use to make decisions. Great. Well, we're going to bring this to an end, and, uh, but I will make a couple of announcements. First off, join us outside on the lawn outside of LKSC for the Corporate Tech Showcase. 
and equally importantly, uh, posters with our, uh, from our trainees, our students. So please join us. Breakfast tomorrow morning at 7.30, first session at 8.15. Join me in thanking Dr. Califf and having a great day.